October is officially over and that means Halloween is done. And there's one thing that I've noticed in Halloween and when it comes around every year, candy is really tempting for kids. This happened a few years back where I put a bowl of candy out uh, on my front porch and uh, me and my wife went to hang with some friends uh, for Halloween. And we get back and all the candy's gone. We say, what, what happened? How did all the candy go in that amount of time? We look on our doorbell cam and a kid came up took the whole bowl and put it into their bag and left. It was just too tempting. The bowl was just there with all of this candy. They could not resist the temptation. Over the next three weeks, this is what we're talking about. We are starting a new three-week series on temptation, and uh, we're going to be talking about what it looks like to resist temptation today. So I hope that you really enjoy today's message on that. Thank you so much for being here today, and welcome to SMCC Online. Hey, well, it's good to be with you. Um, hey, I, I want to start with this. I, I remember the night. Uh, it, was, it was 20 years ago now, and uh, I was with my friends, uh, and we were, at, we were at a house party. And uh, while we were there, my friends, uh, they, they dared me uh, to do something. They, they dared me to take an orange that was there at the party, throw it across the fence, across the road, across another fence, and hit a home. And uh, I knew that, that, that doing that would have been wrong, but it also sounded just a little bit uh, like fun. And so um, in the moment, I, I started thinking about, about this, you know, if, if, uh, if it was wrong, I, I knew it, but it was also an opportunity to uh, level up my worth in front of some people who were worth a whole lot to me, uh, my friends. And in that moment, as I began to think about whether I would do it or not, temptation set in. Temptation, it set in. I mean, it, there was risk involved. I mean, I, I could risk it. I could throw it and risk damaging somebody's property. But at the same time, if I would do this, I could really increase my popularity and my reputation inside of my friend community. So, so in that moment, my mind, it's, it's racing. My heart is beating. And there I am just holding this orange, thinking about whether I would do it or not. Temptation had set in. And I was believing this. I was believing this lie that if I were to do this and impress my friends, my value and worth with my friends would go up and it would all be worth it in the end. And by the way, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? It's just an orange anyways. So I rear back. I'm a lefty. I rear back and I let the orange fly. And I don't know if it was a combination of the wind or an orange that just wasn't ripe enough yet or my incredible arm or a very weak and fragile sliding glass door at the back of the home. But the orange hit that glass, that sliding glass door, and it shattered. And I ran. And what I learned that night is something I want you to know today. By the way, I didn't stick around long enough for the applause for my incredible performance. I took off. And as I got home that night, there was this thing running through my mind, something I learned then, and it's something I want you to know now. It's the first fill in the blank today for taking some notes from home, and it's this. Every temptation is a whispering lie. Now, by the way, real quick, if you woke up in the year 2001 in Battleground, Washington to a shattered sliding glass door, I want to make it right. I didn't have a chance to do it then, but I would like to do that now. I will buy you a few sliding glass doors and a basket of oranges to tell you how sorry I am. I didn't have the chance to make it right back then, but what I have the chance to do now is have a conversation with every one of us about the power, the risk, and the danger of temptation so that we can know how to fight it, and how to resist it, and how to get through it. So today we begin a short three-week series all about temptation. 
And the series has a tagline behind it. The tagline is this, whispering lies. Because every temptation is exactly that. Every temptation is a lie whispering something to us. And so in this series, we are gonna study the three temptations that Jesus experienced, the temptation narratives that we find in the Gospels. And the hope is that we would be able to accomplish something together, that we would see how temptation is structured. We would see what it is, why it's so powerful, but what it takes to expose it and move through it. And it's a bit like the old show Scooby-Doo. I don't know if you remember that show, but in many episodes, there would be this moment where the main characters would rip the mask off of the evil villain and expose the evil villain for who, who, who he or she actually is. And it was really just a powerless person. And once the villain was exposed, it just wasn't all that scary anymore. And this is what we want to do with temptation. When we can expose temptation for what it is, when we can unmask the lie whispering to us in it, we can resist it and we can actually move through it. So there's really this big idea running throughout the whole series. And it's this, the best way to resist temptation is to expose the lie behind it. And so in this series, we wanna expose that lie. A few weeks ago, we had a conversation here at SMCC about doubt. And we said that doubt is a whole lot like a haunted house, scary at night, but not so scary in the light of day. And this is how temptation is as well. In the dark, when we're struggling and the lie is whispering, it can be so scary, so haunting, and just oh so powerful. But when you can break down the temptation, expose the lie behind it, replace that lie with truth, then you can move through the temptation in a way that honors God, that maintains conviction, and leads to full devotion and full delight. And this is exactly how Jesus went through his temptation. So what we're going to study verse by verse over the next three weeks is the scene from Luke chapter four. The temptation narrative, it's included in the gospel of Matthew. It's briefly referenced in Mark and it's included in Luke. And so we're going to break it down verse by verse over the next few weeks. We're going to look at the first temptation today and the next two over the next few weeks. And we're going to discover how Jesus moved through temptation. But more than that, we're going to see who he is in the midst of temptation. And so we're gonna begin today in Luke chapter four. Uh, Jesus has just um, been baptized by John. John the Baptist has baptized him. It's really this inaugural moment as Jesus is about to begin his ministry. And as he's about to begin his ministry, something very interesting happens. He's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And it's there in the wilderness that the temptation happens. So we're gonna pick it up in Luke chapter four and read about the first temptation today. There's a lot going on in it. And so we will, we will break it down. So Luke chapter four, verse one, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit left the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted. He was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of, of son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. This is the first of the temptations. So what I want to do is I want to frame up what's going on inside of the verses that I just read. There's a lot happening here. There's a lot in this that can be pretty confusing. And so in order to make sense of this, I want to give you the structure or the table of contents, if you will, to today's message. There's three things in this section that we need to unpack if we're going to understand the section. So I'm going to give you those three things at the onset of the message, take you through them, give us the big idea, and we'll really see how applicable and helpful this is in our lives. So the scaffolding of today's message is really uh, three things, includes three things, the, the wilderness, the Satan, and then the temptation Itself. So we need to understand those three things if we're going to understand this passage. So we're going to begin with the wilderness. When we read this, or when I used to read this, I'd always get pretty confused because I was always wondering, why did Jesus just take off into the wilderness? Like Bear Grylls, why is he off into the wild? I mean, what is the point 
of all of this. It was always a bit confusing. And I just said, well, you know, sometimes the Bible's confusing and Jesus just wanted to take a hike, you know, get out into the wilderness. And I was like, but the spirit led him there. So clearly this is built in somehow into his identity or a plan that connects to the plan of salvation. I mean, how do all the dots connect? And I used to just skim over it. And then one day I was in class in seminary and my seminary professor as I was studying for my master's, his name was Al Bayless. He was an older gentleman, Al Bayless. He had written a book called From Creation to the Cross. I think you might still be able to find it. And that day, he connected the dots for me from this wilderness expedition with Jesus and the wilderness expedition that happened in the Old Testament with the Israelites. He began to connect the dots for me of 40 days uh, in the Old Testament when the spies were to spy out the land and 40 years in the Old Testament as the Israelites wandered through the wilderness and then the 40 days with Jesus. And Jesus talks about bread here and Satan tempts him with food and bread was very present in the Old Testament narrative as well. And I began to see the parallelism. I began to see the pattern. What Jesus was doing in this moment was patterned after what the Israelites had already gone through in the Old Testament. And the dots began to click for me. And as I began to see how all the pieces fit together, I began to see this wasn't just a random throwaway detail in the life of Jesus. This is a powerful moment that would redefine and redeem this part in Israel's history. So let me show you that now. In the Old Testament, there's a book inside of the Pentateuch, the book of Numbers. Is what it's called in English. And the book includes a whole lot of numbers. And those numbers can seem a bit obscure once again to us or like they're insignificant details. But really, those details serve as an indicator for us of God's faithfulness to Israel. They, they help us see the administrative detail that went in to documenting God's faithfulness to that nation. So I wanna show you some of the pattern. So I wanna take us all the way back to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll start with Numbers chapter 13, verse 25. Numbers 13, verse 25, there's a small detail that you might be tempted to read over, but I wanna draw your attention to it. Uh, Moses says this, at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So in the wilderness, exploring the promised land, the uh, scouting out of the land was, was 40 days. And so that number becomes pretty important. And then in the next chapter, in Numbers 14 now, uh, we see a little bit more explained. Numbers 14, verse uh, 31. 14, 31, we see, we see this. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I'll bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. That word is crucial to the story. Your children will be, will be shepherds here for 40 years. So we have 40 days, 40 years, and the wilderness. I mean, this is not just a plot of desert land. Wilderness would really serve as a title for an experience where people would, would fail to trust God. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me to have me against, against you. So what does all of this have to do with Jesus? Well, when you understand what Israel was meant to be and what they were not able to be, it helps us see who Jesus actually is. So the Israelites were given this great purpose um, to reveal God to the world, to be a light, a source of hope to people, where that people could experience and understand what God is like because of how this nation would live in response to his goodness. That was the plan. And yet they were unable to fulfill that mission that God had given them. And so we see God's promise to Israel um, preserved and fulfilled throughout their story that in spite of their lack of trust and rejection, God was not done with them. And so the Old Testament documents this story of people trusting and then not trusting and obeying and then disobeying. And their story unfolds in the Old Testament. There were seasons of captivity and, and exile and all of this went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so by the time we get to the New Testament, uh, Israel has begun to kind of filter back into Jerusalem a little bit. But, but let's just be clear. I mean, they were unable to fulfill what God wanted them to be. 
And now there is a new Israelite on the scene. Not a community this time, but an individual. Not the Israelite nation, but an Israelite person. And Jesus comes on to the scene. And when he steps out into the wilderness, the astute reader, the careful listener would have understood what will he do now in that wilderness? We know what happened to the community in the wilderness. They failed to fulfill what God wanted them to be. But what will this individual do now? Oh, wait, he was out there 40 days. That's a hyperlink back to the careful reader. They could connect the the dots back. What will he do in those 40 days that the spies didn't do in theirs? And so really what we see is this pattern emerge. And when the dots begin to connect for the careful listener, the careful reader, which is what I want us to be, we will see something. It happened in the first century. It still happens now. God knew exactly what he was doing. Salvation was at hand. A savior was at hand. It was not lost. God's plan was not all done. And so Jesus did what Israel was unable to do. Jesus passed the test that Israel did not pass. Jesus was faithful through the temptation when Israel was not faithful in the wilderness. And in doing this, and this is a big idea, you could write it down, Jesus was what Israel was not. And there are times in the New Testament where we see Jesus step into some scenes that look a bit strange to us, 2,000 years removed, But to the careful reader, the careful listener, the person who understood these important details in Jewish history, it was an aha moment. These are not throwaway details inside of the story. They are details that let us know Jesus is redeeming and redefining what salvation is all about. And it's all about him. He is the savior. He is now at hand. It was an incredible moment. I don't know if you've ever uh, taken a picture to reenact something that happened in the past. I don't know if you've ever done this. Uh, Many years ago, my friends, some of my closest friends, we were at a wedding and we took a picture. And uh, 10 years later, we took the same picture again, all of us in the same pose. And it was so interesting because you know this, it's nice to see how the story has unfolded, but it's nice to see how the relationships are still connected. And sometimes couples, their families, they reenact a picture from the past because in the reenactment, we catch a glimpse of what's going on inside of these people's story. And in a a bit like that, but in a far greater way, Jesus is reenacting a scene, a scene that was crucial to salvation, a scene that Israel just was unable to stay faithful in, but a scene that Jesus was always faithful in. Not a throwaway detail, an important detail in God's plan for humanity. Now, that's the first chapter in today's message, the wilderness. The next one, making sense of it, might be even more difficult. The next chapter or piece of scaffolding for us today in the structure of the message is the Satan, the Satan. Some of you might be thinking this, even when I read it, you might be thinking this. What type of person in the 21st century with more than like a third grade education, actually believes that there is a real Satan. I mean, you might be thinking, Eric, come on, like, really? Maybe you're thinking, okay, I get it figuratively and metaphorically, evil and cruelty can be personified in our language, but come on, surely you're not actually talking about a real being. I mean, for some people, they think that's so narrow-minded, kind of so traditional, so reductionistic to actually believe that. I understand where you're coming from, if that's the way you think. And actually, I used to think that way as well. But over the last few years, I've processed a few important parts of reality that have helped me see some things differently. And I want you to know this. Everybody has an understanding of what's gone wrong in the world. Everybody has an understanding of what evil actually is, where it came from, what it's doing, and what will take care of it eventually. Every worldview has an understanding of evil. And I want to start with this. This is very important. In the modern secular view, evil is a sociological or psychological problem. The problem is that people don't have enough education, don't have enough finances, don't have enough community, don't have enough training, don't have enough medicine, don't have enough therapy, don't have enough opportunity, and therefore evil exists in the world. It's completely psychological or sociological. It exists inside of the mind. It exists inside of community. 
This is a very common approach, which, which then means if there was just more education and more financial you know, support and more opportunity and more community and less ignorance and you know, more inclusion, then I guess all evil would go away, right? I mean, that's the modern or secular understanding of what evil is, where it came from, and what will take it away. The thing that will deliver us from evil is some things on the outside. The assumption being that the things on the outside will change what's going on on the inside. But isn't it true that we've known people and we've known cultures and we've known leaders and we've known, we've known nations that have had all of that, all the therapy, all the training, all the education, all the unity, all the community, and we're still absolutely evil. I mean, just take Nazi Germany, for example. So I think we know this deep down, that evil exists in places deep inside of us. And to narrow all evil to these things on the outside, I think that is too simplistic. I think that is too narrow-minded. I think that is too reductionistic. In order to truly understand the source of evil, the problem of evil, and the solution to it, we need to go deeper than that. And that's where the biblical worldview comes in. The Christian worldview is different. It's this, evil is a spiritual problem that affects sociology, psychology, and biology. That is not mainly a psychological problem or sociological one. It's a spiritual one built into the fabric of, of our world. And you might say this, Eric, well then, you know, like where did evil come from? Who created evil? Evil is the absence of that which is good. It is not a created thing. It only exists in the absence of good, which absolutely is a created thing. So in the story of reality from the Bible, um, someone is rebelled against a good God who made all good things. And now that someone wants to take all good things and steal them from the creation. And so this evil one is doing just that. And so evil has now marked the heart of every person who has ever lived, um, causing them to choose chaos, choose self, choose to rule over people. And now that evil, often called sin, is crouching at the door, waiting to devour people like a beast. And so it's infiltrated all of humanity, poisoning that which is good, turning people towards, towards self. But in the story of reality, victory is coming over evil. Jesus has already conquered it. Death is a defeated foe. And one day sin, death, and all evil will be done away with once and for all. And that story is it's what the Bible says. And on, on top of that, I think most movies that are dealing with the theme of good and evil, they are all patterned after that story. And so when it comes to this story of what caused evil, the, question is, okay, what do you call this being then? This evil one? Well, in the Hebrew language, it's this word, Satan. It's a Hebrew word for accuse or adversary. It's not a name, but a title. A title often used with a definite article in front of it, the accuser or the adversary. Um, really, a way to think of it is the anti one. The anti-good one, the anti-God one, the anti-Christ one. It's the accuser or adversary who lives in absolute rebellion against all that God is. Therefore, Satan, the Satan, is the anti-one. That's in the Hebrew language. In the Greek language, it's a different word. It's the word diabolos. It's where we get our word diabolical. Translated into Latin, translated into English, it's the word devil. And it comes from the Greek word for slander or attack. It literally means to throw across. Balo means to throw. Dia means in the path of or across one's way. And so this devil, once again, a title for how one behaves, is constantly throwing this type of evil in the path of everybody who lives. And by the way, it was just Halloween. And uh, temptation always sets in at Halloween. I saw this recently. In fact, my Facebook was blowing up with this. In Utah, it's very common to leave the whole candy bowl out front. It's very common for a kid not to be able to resist such temptation. I mean, putting that candy bowl out in front, it's like throwing, it's like throwing something in the path of a young child who thinks, by the way, believing a whispering lie, that if they take all of that candy for themselves, their life will be better. However, they are robbing that experience for anybody after them. 
And so all over Facebook, you see these door cams of people taking the bowl, dumping it all into their bag, okay? The temptation was just a little bit too strong. But this is what the tempter does for people. It's what the tempter has always been doing, throwing this type of thing in the way of someone's path so that they might choose them So if Jesus is really going to deal a death blow to evil, sin, death, and Satan once and for all, wouldn't it make sense that in the beginning of Jesus' approach to fulfilling this role, this mission, this purpose that he has, that the tempter, the diabolical one, would diabolo something in front of Jesus that would try to lure him away from this purpose? That's what the temptation narrative is all about. Now, one more thing before we move to the third chapter of today's message. There's, there's another angle at which I think it's important to consider that the devil or the Satan or the accuser, the adversary is not this red pitchforked, this, you know, red jumpsuit pitchfork type of, type of being. And, you know, I, I think, I think this is very, very important. Um, if we take Jesus seriously and take him seriously when, he, when it comes to love and, and peace and mercy and forgiveness and, and healing, all these things that we absolutely value, wouldn't it make sense that we would take him seriously about the other things that he talked about as well? And I've tried for the life of me to understand how Jesus could be right about all of those things that we think he's right about already and then be wrong about this Satan. The reason I think that Satan is real is because Jesus thought that Satan was real. And more than that, Jesus had interactions with this one. And so Satan is not Jesus's half brother, little brother, you know, evil side of good, yin yang type of thing. He's a deceiver. He's a plagiarizer. He is parasitic in nature, preying on all that God has made, all the good that God has created in the world. Thus Satan is twisting that, reversing it, poisoning it, perverting it, and trying to cause people to turn within. But Jesus didn't take that temptation. See, the temptation narrative, we should be so clear. The point is not this. Jesus didn't give in to temptation and you shouldn't either. There's far more going on in the passage than just that. So we've talked about the wilderness, where that came from. We've talked about the Satan and what he is about. So let's move to the third chapter. It's the structure of today's message, the temptation itself. Jesus was a Jewish individual. Fasting would have been a normal thing for him. And so he has just got done with the fast. Of course, he's hungry. I want to read Luke chapter four again, and then we'll break down the temptation itself. So in Luke four, let's read it one more time. This is what the temptation is. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. At the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. That's a quote from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, every temptation is a whispering lie. And the lie being whispered here is this. Jesus, don't you know that you exist for you? Jesus, don't you know that your power should be used on you? Jesus, don't you know that your glory is what you should be living for and you should use your own power to take care of your own needs? Jesus, make your life about you and your life will be better. This is the lie that's being whispered to Jesus here. Jesus never made his life about himself. Jesus never leveraged his power for himself. And by the way, had he have given in here in the wilderness, I'm convinced he would have given in on the cross and taken himself off of it, using his power for for himself. When he says man shall not live on bread alone, it's a hyperlink back to the Deuteronomy passage because Israel was unable to trust God fully in that way. But Jesus, he would. Jesus, he did. So he doesn't believe the lie that his life exists for himself. God's glory is not enough, the lie is being whispered. Your glory is what you should be living for. And Jesus says, my glory, I'm gonna glorify God with my life. That's the point that he's making. So temptation is desire for something other than devotion to God. And isn't this same temptation something that shows up in our lives as well? 
I mean, that it's my life for me and my money for me and my power for me and my authority for me and my body for me and my feelings for me. I mean, this same temptation exists deep down inside of all the temptation that we face as well. And if we believe this, I'm convinced, if we believe our life exists for us, the world will be worse off and we will be worse off and our relationships will be worse off and the people that we love will be worse off. So where does this temptation show up? I wanna talk um, to the dads in the room for just a little bit. I'm a dad and I experience this same temptation quite often. When it's been a long day at the office, some difficult meetings, some difficult emails, people have have been, you know, in conversation with me all day. You know, we're tired. We've put our work in for the day. But when we get home, this is my time. It is for me. And our wives are there. And the kids want our attention. And in that moment, there's this temptation, this whispering lie that comes our way. Dads, I think you've heard it. Hey, <clears throat> you've done your part. You can check out now. This moment is for you, not them. My friend Trevor likes to say, this is clocking in for the second, the second shift. <laughs> and really, isn't it the more important one anyways? I mean, there will be a day that someone else does all that you do at your job. Your kids will never have another dad. And it's in those moments that the whispering lie creeps in and says, your life for you, take it, go for it. When really God would want us to say, no, our life for them. So had Jesus given in, this whole thing would be different. And this really is our gospel truth today. Had Jesus given in, he would have given up his ability to be our substitute. His record would be flawed. His record would no longer be righteous. The thing that he has substituted to us is his righteous record. But had he have chosen himself in this moment to turn stones into bread using his power for himself, he would have given up his ability to be our substitute. Temptation, and we'll talk about this in week three of the series, there's always a substitution. It's this for this. Jesus did not substitute his perfect record for using his power for himself. And therefore, he can still be our perfect substitute. So when it comes to temptation, here's what I want us to see. It's really the heart of our application today. Every time you are tempted, do you think you could expose the lie? If temptation is a whispering lie and the best way to resist it is to expose the lie, this week when temptation comes, do you think you could expose the lie behind it? I mean, take any temptation that you've seen, any temptation that you've gone through personally and look for the lie behind it. We'll talk about just exactly how to do this as our series unfolds, but I wanna give you a glimpse of what this looks like. I mean, one of the most common temptations is in the area of sex. The whispering lie is this, more sex my way more sex in the ways I enjoy, more sex in my life will make my life better. That is a lie. Here's another one. More money in my life, money spent on me, my way will make my life better. Take it, go for it, believe it. But come on, expose that. That's a lie, it's not true. Unforgiveness, harboring bitterness. If I hang on to anger, I will be able to judge them and I'll get justice my way. So I'm not letting it go. God will judge, he is just. Expose the lie behind it. More pleasure in my life. If I have more good feelings, my life will be better and I will feel my way into the type of satisfaction I want. That is not the way. Expose that lie. This is where we're headed in the series. Temptation is a whispering lie. And the best way to resist it then is to expose the lie, knowing that lies ultimately hurt others and they hurt us. And this then brings us to our bottom line today. And this is the hope inside of temptation. It's this, let temptation move you deeper, deeper into devotion. See, listen, if temptation is a whispering lie, and if we can truly expose the lie, then doesn't that mean we can combat the lie with God's truth? And if God's truth enters in, in the moment of temptation, because we've exposed the lie, we can engage that truth, obey that truth and build our life on that truth. Doesn't that mean that on the other side of temptation is actually devotion? And we say it all the time at SMCC, on the other side of devotion is full delight. And this is how God is at work inside of temptation, exposing lies, correcting them with truth, knowing that truth actually leads to our good. So the next time you're tempted, and by the way, no one is exempt from temptation, I hope you can consider this.
expose the lie, replace it with what's true, and allow that temptation to drive you deeper in to devotion. So how do we resist temptation in our lives? It's pretty simple, but it's very challenging. We expose the lie behind it. So this week, when temptation comes whispering, could you unmask it for what it is? Because when you do that, I'm convinced you'll do what Jesus did. You'll be able to resist it. Would you pray with me? God, um, every one of us uh, has faced temptation. And I think for a lot of us, we've tried to fight it in a lot of different ways. Sometimes just willpower, sometimes just telling, us don't, telling ourselves don't fall for it. But I pray we'd have a different approach. We see it modeled in the life of Jesus. And that's to expose a lie, to replace it with that which is true. Would you help us do that in the areas where we are tempted this week? But Jesus, ultimately, I just wanna say thank you to you for not giving up your capacity to be our perfect substitute by not substituting yourself for your sacrifice. So we're grateful for that. I pray that we would see your goodness here in this wilderness narrative and that through this study, we too would be people who wouldn't substitute that which is most important for instant gratification inside of temptation. Give us the ability to expose lies, we pray, through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Ryan and the band, for leading us in that song and reminding us of the truth that the battle belongs to Jesus. He has already overcome that for us. And it means that we can look to resisting temptation by exposing the lie behind the temptation. If you would like to connect with one of our staff or pastors, you can do that easily by right now going onto your phone or your laptop, opening up a new tab and going to smccutah.org slash connect. We'll make sure to reach out to you after you fill that out. It takes 30 seconds to to do and we would love to get in contact and connect with you. See if there's anything that we can help you with. Now, next week we are continuing in our temptation series with Pastor Trevor. And if you can't wait till next week, you probably need to hear next week's message because it is about getting the immediate, immediate satisfaction, that temptation of having everything I want right now. So I hope to see you here next week at SMCC Online or at one of our locations. Take care.